My name is Jared May. I manage programmatic media at Textile, and it is a privilege to be speaking with you all today. Before we discuss any of this fun stuff, I think it's appropriate that we give a round of applause to everyone from Media Post. Um, this has been an amazing event. Uh, this is my first time coming to any of your events, and I personally cannot wait until uh, the next one rolls around. Tahoe, I think. <laughs> um, before, we, uh, you know, before we talk about anything, I think it's important that we have an agenda. We have some grounding in what we're going to cover. Uh, so first, we're going to walk through uh, a little bit of a background on textile, just so we all understand uh, the brand and then who we are and what we're doing. Uh, then we're going to specifically go into some just video and audio stats. A lot of this, um, they're not going to be necessarily new numbers for a lot of us, but I think it's important that we're just reminded of how rapidly these spaces are growing. Um, I think also next we're going to dive into what happened uh, with our video and audio experiences, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and finally, key takeaways from you know, that. And then we're going to migrate into something past reality and what could be going on in the Media Post Summit of 2039. Uh, what do we think are the crazy concepts, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, once again, that we will have to deal with as you know, data and programmatic uh, teams? So uh, Textile Fashion Group, as Steve was describing, uh, there's five different brands that actually make up uh, the, the full group. Uh, our media team actually is a shared service. So we're responsible for all five brands. We do everything in-house. That means creative. That means uh, everything from key hands-on keyboard. Um, we're actually the ones who maintain the relationship. There's no agency in between us and any of our partners. Uh, we do everything self-service, which I think gives a lot of flexibility. Uh, gives us a lot of insight into data, et cetera. Um, that lets us have over 5 million members that are you know, centrally located to 10 different countries, somewhere around there. So we have a pretty, pretty impressive global scale. And a lot of that has been fueled by uh, programmatic growth. So this chart on the right is just looking at the first uh, couple months of the year. Uh, we're relatively new in this space. Programmatic is not something that we've been doing for an extremely long time, but it, something that we're really excited about. Our investment dollars are growing. We're driving people to the site for a cheaper amount, and they're signing up. Uh, we're super excited about what that means for the future. And obviously, audio and video um, should be a big part of that. 2019, video was added. It's hard to you know, separate out at the very a specific moment what are those conversions coming from video versus display in terms of the path. But we're doing that analysis right now. So in general, um, Banner ads are still the, the bread and butter, right? Most of what we've discussed this week, most of the strategies, um, they've all gone back to banner ads. So why should we lean into video and audio? Uh, as you can see from this extremely scientific chart that I put together, um, it's not apples and oranges, uh, but we can you know, still compare fruit, right? So display ads, they're gonna be a little bit cheaper to build, they're cheaper to buy, and they're quicker. Uh, I think it's important that we recognize the ask we put of our design and creative teams when we ask for video. Audio as well. These are huge requirements. These are also teams that are used to making TV spots. Programmatic video is totally different, and we should definitely not have any sort of uh, you know, reliance on those same concepts. We'll speak about that a little bit later. Um, but once again, just remember how much time and money are going into these video ads. So we have to make sure that they convert at that much of a greater rate and provide that much more of a pop for the brand. So answering that question of why, uh, the media space is just getting more and more crowded. People no longer click on ads, and you know, there's just so many different brands out there trying to compete for your voice. You have to have a really good way of finding that consumer and making your voice heard. Also, it's what easier way to have a voice than in video or audio. You literally have a voice. You don't have a 300 by 250 ad. You have 60 seconds to tell a full story of your choosing. So I'm not going to patronize you by reading all of these stats, but they're pretty impressive. Um, just thinking through the Cisco is uh, second from the bottom, Cisco has projected that more than 80% of all internet traffic will be video by 2021. That, it's an opportunity that we can't miss out on. Um, that's a number that I didn't believe at first, and I actually went and found other sources that verified similar predictions. Um, is a programmatic you know, team, it is our responsibility and would be irresponsible to not be capitalizing on 80% of the internet traffic. How could we do our jobs effectively if we're only trying to cap 20% of web 
visits. Audio stats, in some ways, they may not be as impressive, but I think they're still extremely uh, you know, game changing, I would say. Uh, so 12 hours of content is uploaded every minute to SoundCloud. 60 seconds, 12 hours of content. Think about the number of ads that we can insert into that space. Think about the number of brands that you know, could reach somebody as they're driving to work. They're getting up you know, in the morning to go to the gym. Uh, they're listening to their podcast after dinner. Whatever that may be, these are people who are ready to consume media. We're just not doing the right steps to actually you know, bridge that gap. So when we actually decided to go into our personal you know, audio and video journey, it was really important to us that we had a, uh, a strong game plan. There was no um, room for variation. We were dealing with higher CPMs. And we wanted to make sure that we had a good, clean test that we could say at the end, this is something that works for us it, or it does not. Um, so basically, we took our best performing ad groups from display and native, and we applied all of those learnings to video. Uh, we ran at a pretty modest budget. We waited uh, to the second week. Um, and then we started to apply actually some of those learnings. We pushed spends and then cut back on the fat in terms of where we're seeing you know, underperformance uh, and just some really questionable kind of you know, weird numbers and everything. So we obviously had to remove that. What happened? Um, video, I would give an A. Uh, we had certain video specific CPA goals that we were able to reach in a very short amount of time, well within the month timeline that we had originally established. Um, the thing that was specifically amazing to me was the level of direct engagement. Uh, normally, when we think about video, um, I, I, don't, I did not expect people to be clicking on these ads at such a great rate. Uh, I think this is really interesting as we think about where video falls in the funnel. Uh, it's not just an upper funnel tactic. It's something that if you show the right consumer at the right place, you can actually get, get them to really be an engaged consumer with that ad. Audio, on the other hand, is an F. Um, you know, it's partially my fault as a programmatic media buyer. Uh, there was just not the inventory there. And in my opinion, until you can buy something on the open exchange with scale, is it really programmatic? Obviously, there's ways that you can go about getting programmatic audio. But at the core, the open exchange to me is where we do our programmatic buying. And the programmatic industry has to close that gap. So what are we excited about? What's the good news here? So deep stores of video inventory. I just said how there's not that audio open exchange inventory. But on the other hand, we have uh, you know, a lot of video to play with here. We see potential spends in certain ad groups of $2 million versus on display. For the same ad group, we may only see a couple thousand dollars. Uh, this just means that we have that much you know, more work to do. We have that much more inventory to play with. We have that much uh, you know, more noise to kind of cut through to find the right audience. Um, so this is a non-comprehensive word map, but we're currently buying video from over 50 different supply vendors with 10 different data providers. Uh, basically trying to find any customer out there that we you know, can uh, with no concern of where and how we're reaching them. Also, like I mentioned earlier, video is not just an upper funnel strategy that gets somebody aware of your brand. Um, video is something that if you put in the right work, you can actually really use to convert people at any stage in the funnel. Um, so in that second stage of our audio and video plan, we made over 500 optimizations uh, and every single grain imaginable. And that means that we were only reaching the consumers in that lower funnel that we could afford to reach. Programmatic video is inherently expensive. And in display, we can be a little bit more loose sometimes with those targeting. But for video, we had to make sure that we were not showing ads at this certain time of day in this city to these people because they really didn't convert. And maybe it was something weird going on in terms of um, you know, fraud or something. But regardless, those are bad performing segments that were ruining the CPA. This video marketing funnel is not something that we're doing, but it's something that would be amazing to work towards. So if we were able to actually tailor the creatives, just like Sydney spoke about for Chibani, in terms of actually matching what the customer is looking for, um, you know, that brand awareness video is going to be a little bit different than you know, something that feels like an influencer video, where it's really speaking to the pros and everything of the product. So, not only is the consumer adopting video, but the programmatic industry is quickly leaning into this new media type. So I, I know that those numbers are a little bit small. Um, that's programmatic video growth year over year from 2013 to 2020. So that is the investment dollars that we are putting at work as an industry into this new growing space. Also along with it, um, partially why we'd be able to have that growth of programmatic video. 
all tools um, seem to be available in both spaces. Audio is fundamentally different in terms of, as a media buyer, what we have access to, the audiences, et cetera. But video, if we launch a strategy on um, display, we can launch a, same, a similar strategy on video, so then we can actually analyze those results together, build out a Tableau dashboard, and have some really clean test, which means better performance, whether you're concerned about branding or acquisition cost. The last, that was uh, a quote from someone at the trade desk at a CTV event last year, um, a thousand percent increase in inventory. I know that's one specific DSP, but just as a media buyer, my ears perked up and I knew that was exciting because that means there's not gonna be a ton of competition. There's gonna be a lot of uh, you know, exchanges where there's not necessarily the same depth maybe um, as there would be for display. It's not all good news though. Um, I think that we've gotten trapped in a really nasty feedback loop for programmatic audio. Uh, as a media buyer, there's no scale. There's no actual uh, ads that we can buy. Therefore, DSPs, data providers, et cetera, don't take the time to do anything. They, they, they don't create uh, tools that are specific to audio. They don't open up um, you know, any of their uh, you know, audience segments specifically for audio listeners. Uh, and this is all while Spotify, Pandora, and SoundCloud really don't have much of an incentive to um, you know, change up the game. They're still you know, growing rapidly. They're able to add subscribers um, or they're able to you know, add people who pay the premium uh, you know, amount. But I think that we are in a uh, kind of a an interesting gap. Um, so Google Home and Amazon Alexa are now uh, doing streaming services that are free because they're ads. So, Let's take a second to think about what that means. These are devices that people are putting in their homes in different places to perform everyday rudimentary functions. It's just a very intimate way in some ways of communicating with someone. So when they're listening to music, getting ready for work in the morning, when they're cooking dinner at night, when they ask for traffic updates or whatever on that Google Home, or they're playing music, ads will now be part of that. As a programmatic industry, this could either go two ways in my opinion. It could go a way of, black box and it's not something that we're gonna really enjoy from a data sense and we're kind of on the outside looking in. Or it's something that can develop in the way that video has. We see the kind of crazy scale and this opens up a completely new door for us to actually have real scale in audio. So this is a uh, very specific example but fraud gets more painful. As your CPM goes up, you're losing more money. Uh, so if you get scammed on a display ad, you're out one display ad. That video ad is worth, you know, let's say 10 times more. So that's 10 times the amount of money that you have to justify to your CMO that you wasted. Um, this is a uh, double verify um, found example. Basically, Mopub was the biggest offender. There was um, a lot of uh, video ads being ran behind display ads on Android phones. So you're paying you know, 10 plus dollars for a CPM, but you are actually running an ad that is guaranteed to never be seen by anyone. Um, it, just some rough math of you know, what was lost. It's almost a million dollars per month on this one scam. How many other scams are going on like this, et cetera? Um, the only thing that makes me comfortable as a media buyer, we caught this in the data very quickly. Within a couple days, we had already blocked the offending. Android had been bid down drastically and we had already blocked Mopub. Because we saw in the data that we were getting levels of engagement and traffic with no conversions. Fraud cannot fake conversions. That's really important for us to remember as we go through uh, these more expensive media types. So what are we gonna be discussing at Media Post 2039? So this is our uh, escape from reality. We're moving past audio and video. Um, but I think before we talk about what we're gonna be doing uh, you know, 20 plus years from now, we should be talking about what we were doing 20 years in the past. So 20 years ago, um, you know, there's a Best Buy Black Friday ad, uh, your $249 25-inch Sanyo TV. We have the first banner ad 25 years ago on AT&T.com. Um, it's a hard to believe that we've come this far and we're speaking about audio and video in the way that we're we currently are. And this is, once again, just my personal opinion, but everything is already being interconnected. I think the Internet of Things will just take this to an, a different level. Uh, basically, this is that the sky's the limit. 
Um, everything is going to talk to everything. There's going to be instant data passed in safe, secure ways to each other. Um, it, we should all smile and think about the benefits that it's going to bring us. Um, but as marketers, it's pretty cool. So these are three examples that are completely hypothetical with hypothetical brands based on some actual real world examples. Uh, so Patagonia um, could target certain creatives as somebody if they never take their nest temperature above 68. This person clearly doesn't like hot weather, why show them a, a coat? Um, maybe that's you know, too specific, but Michelin, um, they know exactly when their tires start to run down. The car is passing information back to the phone, which is then you know, could be shared out for us to retarget people exactly when they're about to hit you know, that threshold of needing new tires. Not only is it a public safety thing where you could physically save a family from a blowout on the highway, but also you would be able to basically guarantee the conversion, right? Um, Solomon, this, this is actually a real world example. The faster you ski, it's colder. There are now skis that record your G-force, your time, et cetera. If you could respond by that data and understand this person's gonna be cold because they're skiing so fast, you could market them a different jacket versus the person who skis twice a year at 12 miles an hour. Once again, hypothetical, but that's real technology that exists right now. Also, uh, the last point, guaranteed data. That obviously means nothing. Um, I think we are in a, in a place where fear is basically driving a lot of our data privacy conversations. Uh, I don't agree with this quote regarding spiders, but I do think it's true for data. I think that through time and trust and just good relationships, I think what's going on with blockchain is something that could really change how we view data privacy. Um, but I think fear leads to bad law and stifles growth. Uh, the only thing that gives me confidence that we're going to be able to exceed that, something called Moore's Law, I think he uh, was at IBM for a while, 60 years ago. Basically, technology doubles every two years. And if we double technology every two years, it's really hard for us to say with confidence that 2019 problems are going to be happening 20 plus years from now. Just because we're scared about Facebook you know, having our data shared in some illegal way, that's something that could go away, and, or it could get worse. We don't know, but we shouldn't buy time. Um, all of this being said, should we be scared or should we be excited? I think we should be scared of how exciting the future is looking Aww. for programmatic media. <laughs> Find me afterwards. I'm gonna Thank you, there. Jared. <laughs> Hang on. Questions for Jared? Open exchange video is kind of terrifying for me. <laughs> what are you doing to make sure that you're not buying like spoofed inventory, spoofed ad sizes, et cetera, with your guys' like controls? So I would say um, if we were to build out another chart, like the time to build and everything, optimizing video requires so much more TLC. And the second is a team that we remove our attention from it at the same level that we've been giving the week before, CPAs are guaranteed to rise. It is a, you're right, it is terrifying. There are so many different inventory sources out there, 50 different supply vendors. In some ways we're fortunate because being a DTC that is 100% focused on acquisition, we can basically, a little bit of fraud in certain places, in my mind, is, is going to happen. There's a certain number that we spend, there's a certain number of conversions that we get, and that's how we're evaluated. So the open exchange, whether, like, long as we can have enough really high quality inventory, and if, yes, if we did a guarantee deal or a PMP deal, we would have less of that inventory, but we would also have less scale, we'd have less conversions, and that's a really hard trade-off to decide as a programmatic team. Why should we be excited at all about the audio channel? What have you seen so far in, the, in your uses, whether it's direct or otherwise, uh, in, in dealing in this channel? What sort of impact and role do you see audio playing long-term if all of this gets worked out? So. Um, our audio, I gave our audio campaign an F, um, fail, like really not successful. But in the beginning, we had a lot of success with lower, tar uh, lower funnel conversions. Um, I think that the growth we're seeing, I think that once somebody is slightly familiar with the brand, uh, and this is a conversation LJ, our, our CMO and I have had many times, um, if somebody is in their car, they're going, like, they're driving, they're listening to music, like, that's something that it's not, Yes, people still listen to FM and AM, but they're going to be using their phone. 
they're going to be listening in some way that we as a programmatic team can efficiently reach them. Um, I'm confident that it's more of we just have to, as a, basically right now, it's all PNP deals, it's all guaranteed, et cetera. That is not a functional way for us to buy media. The amount of time, et cetera, that has to go into each of those calls um, you know, versus just being able to go in the open exchange and spend that time optimizing, really enjoying the benefits of programmatic and you know, the data access. Um, but I think it's just the fact that like, people are consuming media. If we go back to, The audio detail slide. So it's not the same stark increase that we see in the slides before, but if we look on the left, uh, online radio listenership, um, you know, that's less than 25%, that's, it's pretty low. Um, now it's climbed up to you know, 60 plus percent. That is a huge amount of the population that we are just not really you know, striving to reach. Um, I think the podcast listening is one especially. Uh, I think that is one that it gives people uh, in some ways a voice. I think that there's a um, seeing the success that we're having with influencers. Uh, I think that podcast, in my mind, are a similar way of brands are no longer um, just a brand. No, brands no longer speak down to the consumer as a, a, a conglomerate or a group. They are a person, like in the consumer's eyes. A brand has... Um, social conscious, a, a brand has a voice, a brand has, um, you know, in theory, like, in my mind, they would have favorite restaurants, they would have, like, you know, a political bent, etc. Um, so I think in some ways podcasts give brands the ability to tap into that, in that kind of context. Um, you mentioned the difficulties with cost and creating the creatives, especially across all the different tactics. How are you actually measuring the impact or the way out of actually spending the money and the time to create a television um, video ad specifically? So um, I don't have a great answer in terms of how we're quantifying it. That's an amazing idea that hopefully a year from now I'll have a better answer. Um, we, one of the things that makes us comfortable with the investment we're making into our video development is it benefits all of our um, efforts. So whether it is you know, having great ads for social campaigns or great ads to run on YouTube, uh, pr programmatic video, it doesn't matter. We're seeing video succeed across the media board. Therefore, these ads can be repurposed in a lot of different ways that uh, I think make the time well spent. Hi, Jared. Uh, Michael with Internet Brands. Um, you mentioned that you guys are just doing open exchange and you know, I've worked at multiple major premium publishers and oftentimes two out of three including the one that I'm at now we're taking video off the open exchange so we're talking like Chicago Tribune, LA Times, um, huge huge pubs that you guys are essentially just skipping over and I think you've talked a lot in your presentation about missed opportunity what's your plan in the future is more and more pubs bring their inventory off the open exchange because of fraud to reach those audiences so uh, answering your question with some, an antidote about what we're doing on audio, um, we're setting up those PMP deals. If that's where the market goes and that's where we have to be to tap into the growth that we just talked about, we'll do anything that we have to. Um, it's a question of, as a DTC brand that's just, con just concerned with that acquisition, how long can we find the conversions that we're looking for? How long can we find the scale that we want on the open exchange? Um, and it's obviously the quality too. So your point, if we, if we are finding, you know, there's a certain point that the low quality traffic will maybe not drive the conversions that we're looking for. Um, and that's, that'll be a scary day. I'm not looking forward to that. <laughs> but that that's an interesting divide between audio and video. And video, on the op if you're going in the open exchanges looking for video, then you're less concerned about context and you're looking for audience. But as you just described, the power of audio is very much contextual. It's the power of that individual context and voice and pers personality. And whether programmatic can capture that or, or interrupt it is going to be, a, I think, a real question as we start seeing the technologies you're looking for inserting things in rather than using the host read concept. We may, we may see that value of the context diminish. I thought your uh, example, the five second onion ad, is perfect. It was unobtrusive, but at the same time, it was so impactful. Um, 
or the, I think it was the onion, right? It was like yeah, the, it was five, the, it was the Daily Onion, podcast. and I was wrong. It wasn't Chico's. It was Chili's. Chili's. Okay. Chili's. The restaurant chain Chili's. Yeah. Five seconds at the end of every one minute. Uh, Daily Onion. Yeah. It pops. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the information, and and I agree with that sentiment that we don't put our inventory at dish on open exchanges because we look at the quality of the content that we have in the marketplace. But as you're highly focused on the conversion, just that transaction, how do you find the, the value, the customer lifetime value, which we touched on in our round table yesterday, uh, tied to or attributed to the value of or the quality of the content that you're buying on these open exchanges? So um, at this point, we've uh, done some really in-depth work internally to look at what the average lifetime value of a customer is at different CPAs. So we can understand that if we acquire somebody in this month at this price, it will take us approximately this long to make the money back. Um, in some ways, that gives us a lot of freedom as a media team because we are tasked uh, not at all with LTV. Um, we've had conversations about should we think about it, et cetera, but we're, we understand that subscription model uh, life cycle well enough to just try and get people in the door because we know enough people will like our brand, like our product, and stay. But um, if we were to start thinking about LTV, um, I think the benefit of being able to work with partners like Dish or internet brands in terms of having PNPs where we're only showing to certain types of consumers uh, would be something that we'd obviously explore. Jared's going to lead a roundtable in about 10, 15 minutes on, on all of this. Jared, that was great. Thank you so much.